Good morning, church. We are so happy that you are here this morning. Happy New Year. I hope 2023 has started out with a day. I know it is an exciting year, and we hope that everything you want comes to fruition this year, and that we live a very prosperous year. Um, in Psalm 40, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. So let's stand and just start our 2023 with some worship. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. And together we sing. We 
Opportunities, blank page. This is wonderful. Oh. Speaking of blank pages, there's lots of opportunities to be experienced here at Northside. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to share with you um, about our Sunday school. Sunday school starts at 9 o'clock every morning, on Sunday morning that is. And we have two adult Sunday school classes in this building. Um, just kind of reminder, we talked about them last week, but we have one Sunday school class that's doing a study. Uh, called uh, 12 Extraordinary Women. This is 12 Extraordinary Women from the Bible, and that class is led by Rebecca Pierce. And then we have another Sunday School class in this building. Uh, it's being led by uh, Miss Carol Horton, and she's teaching out of the structured Bible study, and they do some really deep diving in Scripture. I don't know exactly what it is for this quarter, but it's always amazing, and a lot of, a lot of wonderful things happen in that class. And then, of course, we have a, uh, the other building, our CE Wing, we have children's church, children's church classes. We also have a young adults class. And then we also have another class for, we call it the 30s and 40s. They don't let me be in that class. I think uh, Pastor Aaron is leading that class right now. And they are doing a, a new study. They're calling it Foundations. I'm always wondering what that's about. I think it has something to do with uh, beginning and discipleship. But uh, always opportunities to avail yourself on Sunday morning. You don't have to wait till. 10.30 to come in here to be blessed. You can start at 9 o'clock and get an early jump on everything. But just some other things that are going on during the week on Wednesday nights. We have praise and prayer. And that's just a wonderful time in the middle of the week. You know, might need a little extra pick-me-up to get you through to Sunday. And we spend a lot of time uh, singing worship songs and 
We spend time studying the Word, and then we have a powerful time of prayer. And what did Jesus say? My house will be a house of prayer. It's not a house of beautiful singing, although we have that. It's not a house of wonderful messages, although we have that. We're going to have one today. But it's a house of prayer. So I would encourage you. Um, if you don't think you're praying enough already, uh, you might want to take a chance on Wednesday nights and come down and, and spend some time in prayer with us here. Uh, also on the 8th, which is next Sunday, we'll be having a special call business meeting. Uh, we're going to be talking about, or I shouldn't say talking about, we're going to be ratifying Pastor Katie Ferry as our, um, I think what we're calling it is the um, equipping. equipping pastor. This will be a position that will work with our lay leaders to uh, carry out the ministries, various ministries in the congregation. So I'm excited about that. And we'll be doing that next Sunday morning following the morning service. Also, we also have ways that you can give and need to be faithful even in the new year. Um, God's always using all of our resources, money and, and talents and everything else. But we have three ways to give our financial <coughs> gifts to God. We can either give here in the building. There's a plate in the back. Uh, you can give online. If you need information about that, you can, you can contact me after service. And then we also accept it via mail. You can mail it, and we'll be glad to take care of that for you. So I'm just excited again about today and about how wonderful you know, God is, is orchestrating everything. And so let's all stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and invite again the Holy Spirit in our service. God, we just thank you again for this day. We thank you for the blessings that we've already experienced, Sunday school and fellowship time and, and the singing that's already happened. But God, we know that there's always more. And so, Lord, we open up our hearts, we open up our minds, we open up our souls to you. And we just pray right now, in the precious name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would work in mighty and wonderful ways to open our eyes to what you'd have us to see. God, we are forgiven. We are accepted. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But God, there's always opportunities to do more. There's always opportunities to grow. And so, Lord, this is just a time that we just love to be together, but we love to worship you. And we love to come to you and to seek where you'd have us to grow and to go in our lives. So, Lord, just continue to be in our service and bless us as we continue to worship you. First, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we just we thank you for this time that we were able to just praise and bring worship to your name. To praise you for what you did for us in 2012, all the blessings you bestowed upon us, dear Heavenly Father, and for the promise of always walking with us. And as we look forward to this new year, dear Lord, we know that it will once again be filled with blessings from you and that you will walk with us each and every day. And so this morning, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you as we have been through our worship time, been brought, and our focus has been focused on to you as we prepare our hearts for the message that you have given your anointed servant, Pastor Hannah. I ask that you continue to anoint her, dear Heavenly Father. Bless the message that you have laid upon your heart because we know that it's a message for each one of us. I ask that you allow your voice to be heard through her mouth, dear Heavenly Father. As she stands up here today, dear Lord, let us see your spirit, not Pastor Hannah, but your spirit, and allow our hearts to be open to receive the word that you have for us on this first day of 2023. We thank you and we just say that we love you. I ask that you bless each one here, dear Heavenly Father, and let them receive a special blessing this morning through the message that we're about to hear. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, right now, our kids are going to be dismissed. They're going to go back with Emma. Pastor Carey is going with them. Going over to Children's Church. And don't forget, parents, now we're having you go next door to go pick them up. Um, just, you know, give you guys a chance to have a conversation. Give um, you guys a chance to also chat with our children's ministry workers. Get a little feedback from them so you guys can talk about um, the Jesus things that go on back there. So this morning, I am so, so excited to be with, speaking with you guys. I'm so excited really just to be here. Um, like Mr. Darrell said earlier, like, what better place to be on New Year's Day than in the house of the Lord with your family? I mean, on the day that everyone's talking about resolutions, what we're going to do this year, all the habits I'm going to change, I'm going to be a whole new person. The beauty of this place is that Jesus is here. I mean, he's with us too, everywhere we go, too, but he can truly do some transforming work. Amen. So what better news resolution than to say, Jesus, I want to live this year for you. Um, and, and I believe that's what you're proclaiming by being here. And um, I'm going to believe that in faith. So this morning, the title of the message is um, Living Stones, Looking Back, Looking Forward. And at first, I was really scratching my head on this one. I was like, Lord, we're going to Joshua 4. You, can get, you guys can start flipping there if you want to. We're going to Joshua 4 for New Year's Day message. Okay. I don't really follow, but I guess we're going to follow. Um, and then that, that led to today, and I'm really excited for what the Lord has today, um, calling us to be living stones. So we're going to be in Joshua 4, starting in verse 1. If you have it in your Bible, great. If you don't, um, we're going to have it up on the screen as well. So you can follow along. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place you lodged tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the, twelve, from the people of Israel, whom he had anointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? You then shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan... The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to, pe to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes 
of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up the twelve stones in the midst of, in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And there they are to this day. For the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people, according also to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. Believe me, I'm going to recap all this. If you're lost, it's okay. About 40,000 people were passed over. About 40,000 people ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the, batter, on the border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Amen. That's a story and a half, Amen. I'll tell you. Okay, I had to read that one a few times before I understood what was going on. I feel like I could probably read it a few more times in my life. You know, the nature of scripture, it'll always give me something new. But it took me, it took me a few times to understand, I'm like, well, dadgum, how many times are they going to move these stones that were under the priest's feet where they stood in the waters and this and that? I was like, okay. So what happened if you weren't following, or if you just would like a recap, even if you don't, here we go. So the people of Israel had been in exile. They'd been wandering and following the Lord um, for 40 years, and they're finally passing the Jordan into the promised land. And as they're approaching, the Lord is instructing them what to do, you know, how to cross, all of those things. And... Um, so they took stones, one for each tribe, tribe of Israel, we'll get into that in a minute, and passed over, but the Ark of the Covenant passed first and the water stopped for the Ark of the Covenant. And then when it talked about the 40,000 men prepared for battle passed before the people of Israel. So all of the people of Israel are passing through, but the Ark of the Covenant is leading the way and the men of war are leading the way, and they're going before the people of Israel. And the people of Israel scurried across. It says that they made haste across the water. And then they brought those stones, and they set them up where they rested that night. So that's a summary. That's a quick little 30-second version of what just went down. But to put, put it in frame even a little bit more, they'd been wandering. <coughs> Moses had been their leader. He led them out of Egypt. And Joshua now is the new Moses, as scripture calls him, the new Moses. He's the new man in charge. And God saw them through every moment that they had been wandering. Because he knows where you've been. That's our first point this morning. He knows where you've been. So, God's instructing them. He gives very specific instructions here. He doesn't leave anything to chance. He's like, Take 12 stones here, take them, and then carry those 12 stones. Remember the 12 stones I just told you about? Take those, okay, and then you're going to put them here. He's really specific. He knows. 
He knows our nature. He knows our need to understand. He's very detailed in that. He gives his instructions. And did you notice how many times he said 12 and how many times I've said 12? And how many times 12 is all over this story? It's significant, okay? So the 12 sons of Israel, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, 12 sons of Jacob became the nation, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And some tribes we hear great things about. Some tribes we barely have anything in Scripture that talks about them. So even the most insignificant tribe, God said, they're going to be represented in this monument. Every single one, not just the tribe of the priests, not the tribe of the kings that King David would come from, not any of these other tribes, not even the tribes, just the tribes leading the way into battle. Every single tribe is going to be represented in this monument. And God said that over and over and over because he was looking and saying that no family in you is insignificant. Amen. And I think he looks at all of us and says the same thing. Okay, so, so look at yourself here in this story. As we're going throughout today, keep asking the Holy Spirit, where am I in this story? And I think he's, this message, just as much as he's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, he's talking about us. Because we are descendants of Abraham. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we got to fit in those 12 tribes somewhere. I mean, the DNA might not match up, but, you know, the Holy Spirit makes us heirs of Abraham. Yes. So he gives them all these instructions. He includes everybody. Everybody has a part to play in this miracle. And then the people of Israel watch this miracle happen of the water stopping. And they, like, run across as if, like, as if God can only hold the waters back so long, like his muscles are going to get tired. He's back there, I'm shaking, run. No? What? What in the world is that? I was so, what in the world is Israel doing? They just watched Five days short of 40 years ago, they watched him dry up the Red Sea for them to pass across that to flee the Egyptians. So why are they stressing about crossing the Jordan? I mean, what is that about? And this is how, this is how one commentator put it, Matthew Henry, if you want to check it out. He says, some of the Israelites that passed over the Jordan perhaps were so dumb and so little affected with this great favor of God to them that they felt no concern to have it remembered, while others, it may be, were so much affected with it and had such deep impressions made upon them that they thought that there needed no memorial of it to be erected because the heart and the tongue of Isra every Israelite in every age would be a living, lasting monument of it. But God, knowing their frame, knowing how apt they had been to soon forget his works, ordered an expedient for the keeping in remembrance to all generations that those who could not or would not read the record of it in sacred history might come to the knowledge of it by the monument set up in remembrance of it. So the Israelites, maybe, you know, maybe they just weren't paying attention. Maybe they were just following the crowd and they were like, okay, everyone else is rushing. I'm just going to rush too. But then maybe not. Maybe they were like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing, God. How could I ever forget this? There's no way I'm going to forget that. And God, and I don't think that this is in any way him being arrogant, being bitter. He knew the heart of his people, and he said, they're going to forget. So I'm going to set up a monument, because I want them to remember, and I want them to be blessed by the memory of what I did for them today. Because God was with them in 40 years of exile, where they, it, sometimes when you're reading through the Old Testament, it feels like one day the Israelites are like, oh, thank you God so much, we love manna, and you're amazing, thanks for bringing us out of Egypt, and the next day they're like, oh, manna, again? Like, can we get something different here, like some variety in our food, because this manna is starting to taste like cardboard. It feels like some days it was just like a back to back to back to back, and they just would forget and are we any different than the Israelites? Let's be Jesus. honest. There's nothing new under the sun. Satan loves to come back and steal the things that God has given us. Mm -hmm. Amen. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. 
So what better way to do that than to attack our memory, to attack the things that God's already done in our lives and make us think, well, he's done things for other people, but I don't, I don't, really, I don't really remember anything he's done for me. Satan loves to make you feel isolated. He loves to steal things. He loves to steal your memories. But God, looking at the Israelites here, looking at us now, he says, my people are prone to forget, but they will not forget this one, as much as I have anything to do with it. So he called the 12 tribes of Israel, he called every tribe to have a part in that, because those men representing their families get to tell the story to their descendants and say, God chose us, specifically our family, to be part of this monument to a miracle. I mean, I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around what it would look like to see the waters in this giant body of water just stopped. And not just stopped, but the ground was dry. I mean, yes. God emphasized that back in the Red Sea, and he emphasized it here. The ground was dry. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, how can you really run in sandals, okay? They were wearing sandals, let's be honest. They lived in the desert, it was sandals. How can you run in sandals in the mud? Like, you can't do that. God made the ground completely dry. This was a majestic show of his power. So God set up this monument so that he would be glorified and that his people would be blessed. And just like I said, that the enemy loves to come and he loves to steal our memories, but God, God does things so that he can be glorified and we can be lifted up. That's, that is why I love, love journaling. And we, I'm so glad to be at Northside where journaling is something that we just do. Um, I'm thankful, I'm so thankful for Robert and Judy who were my pastors when I was a kid and they taught me journaling and they said, you know, you need to you need to write this down because our memories are fickle. Like we can't trust them. And as a kid, I was like, yeah, whatever. I'll remember. I was just like the Israelites. I was like, oh, I'll remember. It's all good. I'll remember the blessings of God. And I never wrote things down. But thank God for the seeds that they planted in my life. Amen. Because now I have journals that cover the Book of Hannah, so to speak. Okay, I'm not pretending that I'm writing scripture. Okay, don't don't worry. I'm not a heretic. But the book of Hannah I have from college on, and I have this record, this monument of my own, of God's blessing and God's favor in my life. And he knows everywhere that I've been. He knows everywhere that you've been. Yes, amen. Are there parts of your story, though, that don't feel like they might be worthy of being part of that monument? Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you this, that the Lord has seen every part of your story. And he deems no part of that story unworthy of the monument. Because every rock in your past, whether it's sinful, whether it was a good thing, whether it was a blessing of the Lord, he wants to redeem all of it. And he wants to pile them up in your life. Sorry, I didn't get big enough rocks for everyone to see in the back. But there's this little pile of rocks here. And all of it makes up the story. The bad things, the good things, it all makes up the story. This is who God made me. This is the blessing of my life that I am here today, that I am breathing and living in his name. So no part of your story is unworthy. Because... Deeming a part of your story, deeming a part of your story that God saw, that he knows, that he saw back on the cross, back when he was coming, we just, we just got done celebrating, guys, we haven't even cleaned up the decorations, we just got done celebrating that he came to a manger, and he knew all the bad things that you were going to do, and he said, I still love them and I'm going to die for them. So how can the little, little pebble in your past be unworthy of being part of the mountain, the monument to what Jesus has done. Do not, hear me friends, when you have been redeemed in Jesus, your story is redeemed. And allowing Satan to reach back into your past, pick up a stone and say, this 
this was dirty and filthy and it should not be talked about. You need to just forget that it ever happened. Actually, don't forget it ever happened. Dwell on it because it's going to disqualify disqualify you from the miracles that God wants to do through you. That pebble in your past is so shameful and disgusting that you should feel gross. Letting Satan reach back and do that is letting him dismantle the work that God did. Do not let Satan reach into your past. Grab a pebble that God has redeemed and won for you. He won the battle over this pebble for you. Do not let Satan grab it and stone you with it now. Do not let part of your story be the thing that trips you up. Mm. Because you are walking in the path of righteousness. Right. You are walking towards the things that Jesus has for you. And he won everything in your past already. Because again, he knows where you've been. And he still says, all right, son, all right, daughter, we're going to keep working. Don't let Satan throw things at you from your past. Because it's been redeemed. Don't let him tell you that you're struggling with addiction. Don't let him tell you that your life growing up in church isn't a strong testimony. Don't let him tell you that the seeds you sowed in lost family members weren't filled with life. Don't let him take any pebble and lie to you. Don't let him lie to you, friends. Because he knows where you've been. He knows where you've been. And even if you don't feel like you can do that quite yet, even if you don't understand that yet, let's, let's take a look at the fact that he knows where you're going. Because even if you don't feel like you can understand that God's redeemed your past and that all of that is washed in the blood, even if you can't understand that and it keeps you from understanding where you're going, God knows. So he knows where you've been and he knows where you're going. Even if you don't. Amen. When I was working on this, I was like, how can, we, how can I tell them where we're going? I don't exactly know where I'm going. But he said, I know. Do you trust me? If you trust that I've seen where you've been, don't you trust that I know where you've got to go? Yes. Amen. So I said, okay. All right. I hear you. Okay. So let's look back real quick at our passage in verses 19 through 24. It says, the people came up out of the Jordan on the t tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, that Joshua set up at Gilgal. At Gilgal. <coughs> and he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan, <coughs> For you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So this statement, when your children ask their fathers, this is an incredible statement of devotion, rejoicing, and obedience but how right you know there's thousands of people okay at least one of them is going to have a kid that has a parent that asks someday what's what's up with those rocks so that's not that this isn't that big a statement of faith right wrong oh okay so sure it might seem statistically probable that there's going to be offspring here to talk about what was going on there and someone's going to be around the nose but I think it's so, so, so much deeper than that. Because Joshua here, in stating this, believed that his people, his descendants, would be in the promised land. Knowing, <coughs> as Joshua knows, okay, he's familiar with this, he grew up in this, that God's people tended to rebel. They tended to get themselves into sticky situations. 
and God was not thrilled with that. And there are consequences. There are consequences to rebelling against God and being disobedient. But Joshua believed that God said, we're going through the wilderness, and then you're getting to the promised land. He was standing firm in that promise and saying, I know that not just my sons, because if my sons, they're just going to ask me, right? I'm, right? Your sons are going to ask their fathers. That's generational, is going to live in the promise. It's going to live in the promise of being exactly where God took them. But there's another part here. The people who passed over before the people of Israel, what were they? They were warriors, ready for battle. They headed straight old, straight on over to uh, Jericho. Yeah, Josh bought the battle of Jericho. Yep, Jericho. So making sure I didn't say the wrong place. So they headed straight over to Jericho, and they're setting up a monument to God's goodness. He's making a statement of faith, knowing that there's a battle that's about to be waged. God knows where you're going, and he's warning you it might not be the easiest thing you've ever done. See, he has favor. After all the waiting, all the Israelites, we've been waiting, we've been trusting, we've been obeying, and it would be so easy to say, okay, God, I've been waiting, trusting, and obeying, and now I'm in your favor, and I get to kick my feet up, and I get to rest in your favor. Because what did we just talk about? The enemy loves to steal, he loves to kill, and he loves to destroy. So why would he make walking in favor easy? Why would that be easy? It's not going to be. But guess what you have now that you didn't have before? You had the faith that was built in the wandering and the waiting and the obedience that was built up and following a pillar of fire and smoke around the desert for 40 years. Well, actually, five days short of 40 years. They said they passed over on the 10th day of the first month. And according to Bible scholars, you know, I wasn't there, I don't know this for sure, but according to Bible scholars, that is five days short of 40 years. And God told them they'd be wandering for 40 years. Okay, five days, what difference does that make? Five days that God saved them from having to live outside the promised land. That is God saying, you know, I gave you the sentence, but you know what? I'm going to be gracious to you. I am an overwhelmingly good God. So I'm not going to make you wait five more days. So they took all of this. They built the monument. They knew of the battles to come. They made their statements of faith. And they walked into promise. They walked into promise. Do you guys know where January gets its name? I didn't. I really didn't. So if one of you knows, that's cool. But... <laughs> It comes from the Roman god Janus. I know, why are we talking about false gods here in, this, in church? Why are we doing it? Well, that's because it's the name of the month, and that's where it came from. Sorry, that's the facts. And we can either let it be something, oh, that's wicked, or we can allow God to redeem that and say, God, what truth do you want me to get out of that? So here we go. Okay, so the Roman god Janus Apparently, this dude had two faces, and he sat at a door, and he looked in two different directions. He looked back, and he looked forward. Hmm. Can God redeem a message like that? I think so. I think it's appropriate for what we're talking about here today. I think it's appropriate for the timing of today. Because we can look back all day long at 2022 and beyond, however many years we've been on the earth since before that. And then today, we're looking forward. All right, God, you've seen my past. You know what's back there? I'm going to look back there, too, because you redeemed it. And I can look back and see your hand at work. I can see your favor in the restoration. 
and you see where I'm going, and I can look that way too because you have empowered me. Me as your daughter, or you guys as sons, sitting out there, sons, you know, also. Um, I can look forward. I can see where you're taking me. So you, not, you might not know where you're going next, but he does. So how can you know? This is, this, is, this is kind of abstract. It's like, okay, God knows where I'm going, how to, and I'm going to follow him. How do you follow him? That's the question I would have been asking if I was sitting there listening to this message. How do I follow him? How do I know where he's taking me? How can I possibly even begin to figure that out? Ask him. I know it sounds simple. I know it sounds like I'm up here being a smart aleck. But ask him. That's the beauty of journaling. That's what... That's actually just the beauty of God, is we get to ask him questions. And he, sa- he tells us, if you ask and you seek, you're going to find. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> so why wouldn't we ask questions of our Father who loves us and wants to give us the answer? It might take a minute for you to figure it out. You might not sit down at your coffee table and say, okay, God, um, on January 2nd, where are we going to go today? And then he gives you the next 10 years of your life. That's probably not how it's going to go. <laughs> hate to break it to you. hate to break it to this type A planner over here. God's worked on me in that in a lot of ways. That's a whole other story we could talk about sometime. But if you ask him and you seek him, he will show you. Break open your word. Allow him to take you back to show you where you're going. Allow him to turn your eyes to the past to see where he's taking you. Because he will give you a story in scripture that coincides with what he wants you to do in your life. I believe that wholeheartedly. And if you can't, if you struggle and you search and you study and you ask and you ask and you can't find it, I guarantee you our pastors would love to help you. Not a single pastor at Northside would say, you've been seeking God and you can't find him and you want my help to find that with you? Nah. I don't, I, don't, I don't like talking about things of Jesus. Not a single pastor is going to say that. Because that's the beauty of the body. So if you come together, if you ask and you seek him, he's going to show you where you need to go because he has seen where you've been and he knows exactly where you're going. He wants to show you. He is the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. Let him be the light in your life. And as he's done all that for us, he asks only that we would just be living stones for him. Because he's done the redeeming. If you've, if you've asked him to come in your life, be the Lord of it. He has redeemed it all. You might feel like that's a daily battle. It might be brand new for you. You might not even have that yet. And let me tell you, friends, today is the day that it can start. So if you haven't, if you haven't asked Jesus to come in and redeem all of your stones, we're going to have that opportunity here for you in just a second. And I would absolutely love nothing more than if January 1st, 2023, was your first day walking as a living stone. I'd probably start crying, and I can pretty much guarantee that. But he asks us to be living stones, and he's he's redeemed us. And as we walk every single day, that gets a little easier. It gets um, not easier in the sense that life is just chilling and it's good. It gets easier in the sense that I've been transformed every day in the renewing of my mind through scripture and time with him. So in the very next chapter, so Joshua 4 is the story of great miracle and setting up monument. The next chapter literally is when they celebrate the first Passover in the promised land. And they, um, they renew their covenant with God and they circumcise the new generation. So the next chapter after miracle is obedience and rejoicing. God gum, if that isn't what life with Jesus is supposed to be, obedience and rejoicing. That's how you are a living stone, is to live in obedience 
and be filled with joy. Even when things are hard, we're supposed to have some joy, right? Because that comes from the Lord, not from circumstances. So even when the world is crashing down around us, we have to have joy because Jesus died for us. If nothing else, if there's nothing else you can cling to, it's that Jesus died for you. So to sum up this story of where the Israelites are at this point, they were brought out of slavery out of Egypt. They witnessed the parting of the Red Sea and passing on dry ground. They wandered around the desert for 40 years following God in a pillar of fire and smoke and eating manna every day that he provided for them. And then they came to the Jordan and saw the same miracle again, but it was no less powerful because they'd seen it before. It was still just as powerful. And they set up this monument, and then they renewed their covenant with God, and they celebrated Passover. And then they would go on to rebel against God. They would go on to have great times of blessing and returning to God. They would have kings and good kings and bad kings. They would divide as a people. They would wait for a savior. He would come and they would reject him. Some of them wouldn't. Some of them would follow him. And then the story goes on and on and on. Some people follow Jesus. Some people don't. We live good lives. We live. We make mistakes. God redeems. And then we sit here this morning on January 1st, 2023, just as much a part of the story as anything else. Because God has seen where we've been as a people, and as people, he's seen where we've been. He knows our hearts. He knows what we're prone to do. And he makes provisions for that so that he can be glorified and so that we can be blessed. Just as much as I can sum up that story of the Israelites in just a couple of key bullet points. I know that you guys could probably do the same thing with your stories. <laughs> Highlight the big ones, right? The moment I got saved, the moment I fell real hard, the moment God picked me up and dusted me back off and said, let's get back to work. The moment your kids were born, whatever, whatever your story is, it's just as valuable as the ones written in Scripture. Because your story is what God uses the most to bless people around you. Your story was given to you to be a tool. And I've said this before, and I'll say it a million times again before I die, because I'm a pastor and that's what we do. Your past can either be the thing that shackles you down, or it can be a tool to build the kingdom. And your past is your story. And your blessings aren't just for you. I mean, yes, of course, if it only was for your sake, Jesus would have died on that cross. But now, how do you live in obedience and rejoicing and no one else is affected by that? How do you live in obedience and rejoicing and the world just looks at you and says, I don't want any of that. I don't want to be joyful. I don't know what that is. It's contagious. Your story is this light that exudes from you because God is life. He is light. He is good. He is pure. So when we get to walk in the light and our story has been redeemed by light and our stones have been redeemed to life, you are now a living stone. You are a walking monument. You're not stuck by some miracle that God did 20 years ago. You're the walking, talking, breathing, living monument to what God can do. You're not stuck. Don't, don't let the enemy stick you to a miracle either. Don't let him stick you back where God dusted you off because, oh my goodness, that's an amazing. The work and the hand of God is an amazing thing. Miracles are wonderful, but don't stop there. Amen. It would be so easy to just bask in the miracle for the rest of your life. But that's a lie of the enemy to say that God's, God's done with that one. You got your big one, and you're done. No. 
No. God has a lifetime of blessing. Amen. A lifetime of blessing. You might not always get to see it until you're past it a little bit down the road. But God has a lifetime of blessing for you. Ooh, that's just good stuff. That is good news right there. To say that you don't have to stop at a miracle. You don't have to stop at your failure. You don't have to stop in your shame. God has redeemed it all, and he's taking you as a living stone. I think this is really God-ordained that this is called the living stone, not just the stone. Because if it was just the stone, there's no movement there. Okay, it's a testament to what God did, and that's great and wonderful. But we are living stones, meaning we can move. We can leave the coast of the Jordan. We can keep on trucking with what God's doing. So this morning, we're going to do something a little different. Bear with me. On the ends of the rows, um, and if you're sitting on the end of your row, you might be sitting on it. Um, I put some pen and pens and papers, and Micah helped me, of course. Um, thankful for Micah. There's papers, pens. Take one, grab it. And if you have too many on your row, or you don't have enough on your row, look around. I'm sure someone, some row around you, can help you. This morning. We are going to make a record of what God has done. If it's one thing on each side of the paper, cool, great. That's two blessings. But on one side of the paper, I want you to write down. This is, to, this is just for you because you're going to take it with you because this is going to be your monument to what God's done. Okay, this is yours. So you can write whatever you want to. I don't care. Okay, that's between you and God. One side of the paper is going to be what God has done in your past. And the other side of the paper is going to be your question to God. What is it that you want to ask God about where you're going? It could straight up be, God, where, you, where am I going? It could be that broad. God, where am I going? Where do you want me to go? What do you have for me? What's the work you want to do? What do you want to set me free of? What blessing do you want me to walk in? That's what this paper is for. This paper is going to be a statement of what he's already done to give you hope and remind you that he can do whatever's on the other side of that paper. Whatever question you're asking him. Make, make what he's done for you specific. Can you tell us again what goes on each side? Mm -hmm. Yep, so one side is going to be what he's, one thing he's done for you. You can keep writing more things that he's done for you later as you go throughout the day, go throughout the week. But write down something that he has done for you. Something that he's done for Miss Roberta. Something he's done for names. Um, for Julie, for Justin. Just write down what he's done for you on one side, and the other side is your question, your question for God, and it can be broad, it can be specific, but what are you going to be asking God, because he wants you to be an active participant in what he's doing, this is your active participation, okay God, what is it, <clears throat> what's the journey, what's the blessing, what do you want me to surrender? What is it? And just because we start wrapping up service in a second, when the music starts playing, if you still need to be sitting there writing and asking God, then you absolutely should be doing that. Listen to the Holy Spirit. But as we're closing, reflect and dwell on the things that God has done for you. And let that say, Holy Spirit, remind me, and then use that to give me hope for what you're going to do. Translate what he's done in the past for you, what he's done in Scripture, because if the enemy is lying to you right now and you can't think of a single thing he's done for you, look at Scripture. Because everything in Scripture he did for you. That letter is written for you. Let those things give you hope 
for what he's going to do. Let those things give you hope for the situations that you're in that you not see a way out of. God, I don't know how this will ever get better. I don't know how it possibly could. Well, the Israelites didn't know how they were going to pass on dry ground through a body of water. And I'm not trying to be flippant about your situation. I, I promise you that. I'm not trying to make light of the hard thing that you're walking through. But God can do amazing, wonderful things. If he is giving us the authority to walk around as living stones, living monuments to his goodness, and if we're walking in obedience and rejoicing, then that means that the blessing is following us. Because we're the walking monument to his goodness. Why would God let us continue to walk in obedience and rejoicing in his name, glorifying and praising him, and not follow that up with blessing? How is that glorifying his name? So walk in obedience and rejoicing. Ask him. Seek his presence. Seek his answers. Seek his face. And he will, he will answer you. He will follow through. Because he knows where you've been. He knows where you're going. And all he's asking you to do, I know, all. I'm not making light of this, I promise. All he's asking of us is to be living stones. To walk in obedience and rejoicing. This morning, we're going to open up the altars, and our pastors would love to pray with you. Um, if you'd rather pray by yourself, that's totally okay. Just say, you know, just let them know. I just would rather pray, for my, pray by myself right now, and that's fine. But if you would like to come up and pray, and if you need to ask Jesus to come in and do the first redeeming work in your life of being your Savior, then don't miss the chance. Because he wants you to be a living stone. He wants to do the blessing. He wants to do the miracles in your life. So whatever you need this morning, whether you need to bring a specific pebble and say, God, I need you to redeem this one, do that. If you need to come and say, God, where, where do you want to take me? Come and do that. If you just don't even know, but you just want the touch of Jesus, you can come for that as well. Because that's part of asking. That's part of seeking. But there's nothing magical. There's nothing special about these altars here. His presence is just as real and powerful in your chairs as it is up here. But you are more than welcome to come up and pray. And he sees 
through this time that we've had to breathe in your presence. Jesus, I pray that the peace that has filled this room yes, God. would flood our hearts and go with us from this place. Jesus, that the hope in the truth of who you are would give us hope for what you're going to do. Jesus, that it would give us hope for the things that you're going to do, not just in our lives, but in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of our nation, in the lives of people all over the world, Jesus, who need your touch. Because, Jesus, I know that this message of life and light and hope and redemption and renewal, it was not just preached here this morning, Jesus. Because that's your whole thing. That's your whole message. That's the gospel. Jesus, let us feel the overwhelming beauty of being unified with believers all over the world who heard about your goodness this morning. Jesus, would you use us, the people in this room, representatives of so many different families, Jesus, would you use us to bless others and be blessed this year? Jesus, help us to walk in obedience and rejoicing through everything that happens this year. The good, the bad, the ugly. Jesus, give us strength to walk with you. Help this morning, help us set up monuments to what you did, what you've done. So that we can know and know and know and know that you're going to keep doing it. Jesus, be with us in the things that Satan likes to lie to us about. Give us strength to take those th thoughts captive and say, my Jesus has more for me than that. So Jesus, go with us from this place. Just overwhelm the things that we do, the things that we say. Let us be a little bit more like you this year, Jesus. And begin that transforming work right now. Jesus, let us be transformed by the things that were talked about today in Sunday school hour, in children's church over there. Lord, let them be transformed by what they're hearing and doing. Jesus, let us be transformed in this room by what you have done. Let us not leave this moment behind, but let us walk out of here as living stones that get to testify about your goodness and your love and your mercy in your power, Lord. I trust you. Lord, help us to just be your servants. And Lord, be faithful as I know you will be. Be faithful to us in answering our questions, Lord, as we seek you out. As we share our stories with other people, Lord, give us boldness and courage. Lord, I just pray a tremendous blessing on all of us as we leave this place today. Keep us safe and healthy and bring us all back here together on Wednesday and on Sunday. Lord, let us just come together in rejoicing and obedience. I love you, and it is in the power, the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. You are so blessed. Go. And if you have kids next door, don't forget to go pick them up. They will miss you. Um, but be blessed.